broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another webinar, Strat Chat Strat Session. It's the first of 2019. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. We're going to be starting in just about a minute. Um, in the meantime, why don't you take a moment to think about what you want to hope to learn from today's session. You can share it in the questions box, or you can tweet it to us at Strategizer with the hashtag StratChat. We'll be starting in just a moment. All right. Once again, good good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to wherever you are in the world. Welcome to our Strat Chat session. Today's topic is going to be making better choices in today's business world uh, with co-founder Alex Osterwalder and our special guest, uh, renowned number one management thinker, Roger Martin. Uh, as always, I'm your moderator, Kavi Gupta. I manage content and community at Strategizer. Like I mentioned, our host is um, our ever-present co-founder, Alex Osterwalder also uh, co-author of bestsellers, Business Model Generation and Value Proposition Design. Our key guest today is Roger Martin, professor of business at uh, the Rotman School in, at U of T in Toronto, as well as the number one management thinker in the world and uh, a frequent source of inspiration to us at Strategizer. We also have another special guest with us, a friend and collaborator and new member of Str uh, Strategizer as well, Tendai Viki, who is an author and thinker, particularly in the corporate startup space, He'll be joining our call today um, to also color the conversation. So we definitely have, I think for the first time, a, a pretty massive full house. Uh, not on the screen at the moment is also our friend Hank, who will be uh, illustrating and taking visual notes throughout the conversation uh, today. If at any point you want to reach out to us or make a comment about the webinar broadcast, like I said, you can simply pose us a question within the GoToWebinar control panel. Um, but you can also tweet to us at Strategizer by using the hashtag StratChat. Um, I also encourage you to go and check out blog.strategizer.com for more content and resources around today's topic, but also other topics around business model generation and value proposition design. Just a quick mention. Um, you may have seen that our next book is coming up, a uh, working title, The Invincible Company. Just wanted to share with you today that part of this conversation is uh, not only about the work that Roger's been doing, but in a lot of the ways the work that Alex uh, and his co-author and co uh, collaborator, Yves Pinier, uh, have been doing for the past few months and the next few months on the upcoming book uh, that will be coming out as a sequel to Business Model Generation and Value Proposition Design. I'm now going to pass over the... Uh, the controls to Hank, who will make the illustrations. In the meantime, while that's happening, Alex, if you could possibly share why we thought Roger was such a fantastic guest with the conversation we want to have today. That's very simple. Why do we have Roger? Because he's been such an inspiration to our work, and he's the number one management thinker of the world at the moment, and I think rightfully so. So it's always a pleasure to have it's such an impactful guest and what um, I admire Roger about you is that you know you have the right thoughts the right ideas you can get them across in a pretty um, um, very impactful way but you also work with uh, leaders in companies around the world and that really shows so you're making a real difference and I want to kick this off with a very you know with a question you might not even expect but last time we met um, I heard you talk about the lost art of strategy. So when you when you said that, what did you mean? Like how has strategy making and strategic thinking changed in the last couple of years? Ah, so, hey, hey, it's a good question. And, and I, I would just say uh, by way of uh, intro, the, the feeling is mutual, Alex. I think you're uh, one of the guys doing the absolutely best work in, in the world these, these days on on the issues that we both care about strategy and innovation and design and like so the feeling is is mutual um i would say it's been a longer decline than than just a few years uh which is that i i i guess and maybe i'm nostalgic but i look back to the uh the days of the 70s and 80s uh, when 
essentially the practice of strategy in business was born. I really think of back to 1963 with the founding of Boston Consulting Group as the commercial birth of, of strategy. Uh, because before that, you didn't, you, you just didn't have strategy. It wasn't taught. There weren't uh, firms out there. Uh, uh, BCG was a, was a smash hit, went to CEOs to say there are, there are some general rules to, uh, to the way business works. Uh, because previously, people uh, in, in business uh, thought about, well, this is how consumers works, this is how telecom works, this is how utilities work, uh, and you had experts within individual uh, kinds of, uh, of companies. And Bruce Henderson, essentially founder of BCG, uh, sort of said, no, 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 there's a bunch of rules that apply more generally. And there are these rules of, of strategies, you know, growth share matrix, learning curve, uh, blah, blah, blah. And then Bain was spun out of BCG uh, in 1973, my old firm monitor company uh, in 1983. That was the heyday, I thought, of the practice of strategy and you had firms that were focused on uh, on strategy and since is there's been a, uh, uh, an, uh, an understanding by the big so-called strategy uh, uh, firms that there are much bigger businesses than strategy so overhead cost reduction post-merger integration etc so the really big strategy firms actually uh, don't do very much strategy uh, as part of their portfolio so one way in which it's becoming a lost art is that even within the major firms that are still thought of as strategy firms, strategy is at least what I definition of, uh, define as strategy is a small practice, not a big practice. Uh, and so you don't have people in those firms developing deep strategy uh, understanding. The other thing that happened is that the, the strategy kind of faculty across business schools has tilted away from, I think, practical things about strategy into areas that just aren't as, uh, as helpful to real strategists. A lot of what you'd read in, in strategy journals, if you, if you took the time to read them, I don't anymore, uh, uh, would, would be stuff that, that uh, executives in companies don't read, don't listen to, don't care about. Uh, and so, so I, I think what's taught in business schools writ large now on strategy isn't as helpful as it might be or used to be uh, to sending MBAs out with real strategy tools. So the combination of those two things, the strategy firms heading into other areas other than strategy and the worldwide strategy uh, kind of uh, academy heading in a direction that I don't think is is terribly practical has made it the lost art. So most CEOs today, I hate to say this, but most CEOs today, i.e. the majority of CEOs of large companies today, don't actually have a useful definition of strategy in their heads. So it's hard to do great strategy if you don't have a definition. Their definition of strategy tends to be we need a plan right which i call you know mo most strategic plans in in companies are are budgets with pros you know we know they need a budget uh but that's just this financial document and you add a bunch of pros and say that's our strategy but it's just a plan about a bunch of stuff you're going to do as opposed to <clears throat> here's how here's how we're going to play uh, to win in a, in a given uh, in, a, in a given space. Uh, so we've gone from from I think uh, the BCG era, BCG Bain monitor era, and of course I, I shouldn't leave out McKinsey because McKinsey, when B BCG kind of created the world of strategy, BCG said or McKinsey said, "Oh my God, we're going to be decapitated by." BCG, they're going to talk to the CEOs and we're going to talk to everybody underneath. And so they went into strategy. But in that era, there was strategy. Now there's planning, a technocratic activity that isn't actually uh, helpful. Takes up an enormous amount of time, but isn't, isn't particularly helpful. I don't know. That's a long answer to your question. And, I, and I'd be curious uh, because, I mean, one of the again, striking things about 
you, you and I are very uh, similar on this is we hang out with companies all the time, working with them on issues of, of strategy. Do you, do you see that as, as well or, or not? Um, I, I definitely see that as well. And I'd say that one of the things um, that always strikes me is I think strategic thinking today is a lot about innovation. So one of our friends and colleagues, Rita McGrath, all now says, right, like strategy and innovation is more and more a synonym. And if you ask, you know, how much time leadership, senior leadership CEOs spend on innovation, if we call it innovation and, and strategy some, as something similar, you know, there's very little time. And we like to say if they don't spend 20 to 40 percent of their time on innovation, they're not taking innovation seriously and it's not going to happen in their company. It's not even a question of budget and money. It's, you know, the symbolic value of the CEO, of the senior, senior leadership team spending time on, well, how is the future going to look like? How are we going to be prepared for that? So if you take it from that perspective, there is no, you know, in very few companies, if I may say that from my little window on the world, and Tendai here definitely also has a point of view, I think, or <laughs> other guests today, um, there's not a good understanding of what strategy making today should be, in particular because it's very related to innovation now. Um, I don't think there's a very good understanding of innovation in boardrooms at the moment. And that's what's I, I, puzzling I me. Yeah, I would agree, and it, it, it's it's uh, Alex. I, I I I couldn't agree more, and and I I think it relates to. It's not as puzzling to me because it relates to a a another sort of trend in the world of so-called strategy uh, that has been problematic, and this is the this is sort of the technocratic side of it, which is which is the the strategy has become about creating a plan that's based on uh, a crunching of all the data, right? A more technocratic and, and kind of data oriented. And this gets to the, the thing I've, I've, uh, I've written about, which is, which is uh, the world has followed a scientific path based on the original work, work of Aristotle, the world's great, the first great scientist who laid down the essentially the, the principles of the scientific method that became formalized. You know that was that was 2,500 years ago. It got formalized 500 years ago uh, in the scientific revolution, but it was Aristotle. Uh, uh, and what we've done is, is listen to Aristotle in in saying we need to be scientific in determining the causes of the effects that we see. So he was the first first human to say, uh, "Here's a here's a rigorous way to understand the causes of the effects that we see." You know, we experiment, experiment, do experiments, see what's happening, and understand the causes of the effects. But he said something also that the world has utterly ignored, and I mean utterly ignored, and that is that 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 method. And he was very specific about that. It's for the part of the world where things cannot be other than they are. Right. So you know, if I if I have a rock in my hand and I let go of it, uh, it will drop to the ground. <laughs> and if I repeat that experiment a thousand times, a hundred thousand times, a million times, the rock will always fall um, uh, in space. Um, and so Aristotle would de declare that to be the part of the world where things cannot be other than they are. And in that part of the world. He says, you should rigorously collect data on what's going on because what's going on now will go on forever. Right? Those rocks are not going to start to fly away. They're going to fall. But he said, there's an entire other part of the world where things can be other than they are. Right? So that would be the part of the world that in 1998 did not know what a smartphone was because it didn't exist. And then the first smartphone was created in 1999. And now we, can, we operate in a completely different world as human beings. We can't be far from our smartphone. Everything has changed about that world. That's the part of the world where things 
things can than they are. And what he was very specific about is in that part of the world, you must not use this scientific method that I've, that I've created. Because what that will do, if you use that, is it will convince you that the future will be identical to the past, right? Because you crunch data about what's going on now and what's going on in the past. And, and the assumption behind his method is that, that that will happen forever. You'll say, nobody uses smartphones. They, if you ask them in 1998, what is a smartphone and what would you use it? They'd say, I don't know what a smartphone is. I wouldn't use it for anything. Now there are, you know, whatever, four or five billion of them in, in, the, in the world and they're used for everything. So what he said there is in that part of the world, you have two tasks. <laughs> One, to imagine possibilities, and two, to choose the one for which the most compelling argument can be made. That's innovation. But if you believe that it is meritorious to be scientific, then you won't engage in that activity, Alex. That's why it's not puzzling to me. The activity you want to do and he who strategizer and all your fantastic your fantastic work all asks people to do something that they in the back of their minds alex are saying i was taught in business school that what alex is telling me is a bad thing it's not rigorous it's edging stuff Ooh, who would want to do that you want to crunch the numbers uh and and so your methodology and mine uh, are are actually designed to deal with the Aristotle's other part of the world, which I think in the world of business is arguably the most important uh, part of the world. So that's why that's why they don't they they don't love doing what you want them uh, to do. It's probably often uh, Alex the people at the fringes of organizations who who really desperately want to do what you want to have them do do a business model canvas for a brand new idea that has nothing to do with what we're doing now right the mainstream people in organizations are going to often say oh, that's that's dangerous stuff can you crunch the numbers alex to show me that this business model canvas will produce a great uh, idea the answer is the Charles Sanders Peirce, one of the great, uh, the American uh, pragmatist philosopher, just pointed out no new idea in the history of the world has been proven in advance analytically. Uh, they've asked you to do something that has never been done before in the history of the world, right? And that's their, that's their test. Alex, can you do something that's never been done before in the history of the world, i.e. prove that your new innovative idea uh, is successful before you try it? Yeah, I, I love the way you frame that. I think that's that's so spot on. The way what I would add to that is what I like to often say is, well, you can see the world as you know you're a victim of five forces, right? And that's what we mm -hmm. were taught at business school, you know, eight, 1985 and so on. But you can also see the world as possibilities and opportunities. And I like to mm -hmm. show this little video with Steve Jobs where he says, well, look, if you look at the world around you, you know. Stuff that's being created is being be created by people who are not different than you. And this, the moment you realize that anything that was created that is new, take mobile phones, right? Mm -hmm. um, you start to create, you start to see possibilities. And yeah. probably there's never been such an opportunity in, in history ever before where a lot of people had the means you know, to do that. We have the internet, we have mobile phones. So creativity is at our fingertips. And I do think, so my question to you would be, well, when you convince senior leaders to move beyond the world of number crunching, not leaving it behind, but there's still, there's a, still a space for that, but how do you open them up? You know, how do you give them the confidence so they start thinking about the world of possibilities? How do you convince them? What are the three arguments that you use to show them, hey, the world has changed, you better play here. <laughs> um, I'd be very curious how, how, you, how you structure your arguments to get them to move. Sure, sure. Uh, though I, though I, I, before doing that, I just want to come back to something you, you, you said, which I, which I only partially agree with which is that, uh, which is, you, you said, this, this, this is the best time ever for, for creativity. 
It is and it isn't. All the reasons you said why it's the best, I agree that it's the best. However, uh, however, there is one counteracting force, which is which is suppressing that, which we have. To and and if you ask the question, what's sort of the coolest, hippest thing in business these days? What is it? Big data, data analytics. To me, that is what is suppressing innovation. We've fallen in love with data analytics, and data analytics is exclusively, exclusively for the part of the world where things cannot be other than they are. Right? That if, if you just go back to Aristotle, that's where you want data analytics. So, but what I challenge people who use data analytics uh, uh, is to say, are you willing to essentially take the Aristotelian pledge, which, which is if you're going to use data analytics to inform a decision, so the data says do X, you've got to be able to say to yourself, I am looking at the part of the world where things cannot be other than they are. So I'm making a bet that I'm looking at something where nothing can change, in which case it's a great idea to use data analytics, the most sophisticated data analytics possible. But if you can't say, I'm talking about part of the world where things uh, cannot be other than they are, right? then you're making a terrible, a terrible mistake. And you're going to fool yourself. And somebody else is going to invent the future while you're convincing yourself and taking action that assume that the future is going to be identical uh, to the past. So, so there's a good, there's good things in the world uh, about creativity, and there are some uh, some bad things. The other thing I would say is just you you raised the <laughs> Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs is the CEO in our lifetime who essentially, whether he knew it or not, I, I you know, never had a chance to ask them ask them the question, is utterly Aristotelian. What did Steve Jobs spend an entire lifetime doing? A, imagining possibilities, and B, making compelling arguments uh, uh, to, the, to the world about how those things would, uh, uh, those possibilities could be made true. Right? And that's why we love him so much, yet we, we in, the, you know, in the shadow of Steve Jobs' great career, we're pushing data analytics. Uh, but that, that's my, <laughs> my rant on, on that subject. But in, in, in answer to your uh, question, Alex, uh, one, I do make this argument with executives, right? So, so they, to help them understand that the people who are technocratic data crunchers in their strategy organizations, and of course, strategy organizations have become, tended to become full of data crunching uh, uh, people. Uh, uh, I say, say they're going to they're going to make this argument, but it is it is not consistent with the, the the people who actually created science. So I try to try to create that, and then <clears throat> what I what I do is is and this is where you know I'm I'm big into fusing uh, the best of design into the best of strategy is to say um, you know because we can't predict the, uh, uh, the future. We can only imagine possibilities and then try and create the future. You know, it won't all work. Uh, and so lower the bar on thinking it'll work and change the approach uh, to innovation. Don't bet everything on being perfect in, uh, in innovation. Do low risk <laughs> prototypes. Be positive about it. Go test, test things out, improve, 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 uh, and recognize that you need to do a bunch of those things often uh, at the same time, or at least more than, more than one. Uh, and, and what your job is, is to make things true. Right? The, also the job of human beings in, in that second part of, the, part of the world where things can be other than uh, they are is for humans to be the cause of a new effect. So make them true, make these things true by getting ever better and better uh, at them.
recognizing that you won't get the box. So I try to, uh, to convince them by saying there's a, there's a very fundamental philosophical reason why you should be uh, engaging in this kind of imagining of, of possibilities. And two, let's take down the scariness factor by saying we don't have to invest a billion dollars up front before we figured out whether this makes sense. Let's figure out littler ways to invest and incrementally, iteratively, and let's not be cowed if the customer, when they see our first low res prototype says, eh, I don't know, that, uh, maybe, but I don't really like that very much. Okay, what about it? Do you like, how can we improve it? How can we improve it to manufacture a, uh, a win? Uh, I'll let Tendai ask a follow-up question here. Hi, Roger. Um, hi, so it's really, hi, it's really interesting to kind of hear you speak about what you're speaking about, because I'm thinking that like, you know, in the data analytics, in the data analytics world, people can suffer from like, you know, analysis paralysis. But, uh, but you also say often that, you know, strategy is about making choices. And so I'm often wondering, you know, in the world of imagining possibilities, how do you start from suffering from possibilities analysis? So, uh, you know, if you wanting to choose, you know, the most compelling uh, possibility to explore, you know, how do you set those boundaries? You know, how do you decide what's in? How do you decide what's out? Um, do you have any examples, any, any, any practical tips you can give? Because I often see organizations struggle in, in the world of possibilities to choose which possibilities to explore. Absolutely. I think, I think it's uh, a, a challenge, but I think, again, going back to, to Aristotle, it's, it's argumentation. And so I think this is the way in which innovation is a very social process, uh, which is, I think you have, to, you have to make an argument for why this innovative idea makes sense, right? And, and you'll, be, you'll have a bunch of people in an innovation organization with a bunch of arguments. And I think the, the how you choose is the way Aristotle wanted you to choose on the basis of how compelling an argument is. Now, Aristotle was around before, <laughs> before all the designers, right? And the designers would say, Right. Uh, well, I, I, take, I had this conversation with David Kelly, even the co-founder of, of, of uh, IDEO. What I said is, what I asked him is, did you understand when you were developing this rapid prototyping uh, notion? Uh, you know, I do know that that what, what you've said, because you had written lots about it, is that you do iterative prototyping to um, make the what you're doing ever more consumer ready, the consumer will tell you, the user will tell you, oh no, do this, do this, do this, do this. And then you do 10 iterative prototypes by the 10th one, the, 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 you've got something that's you know, kind of close to perfect for the consumer rather than not so great. So I understand that. Did you also understand that as you iteratively prototype and the, can, the user is saying, uh, I like this more, I like this more, I like this more, ooh, this is perfect, this, oh, this is great, this is great that you are making your argument for launching this thing ever more compelling. And he said, no, I've never thought of that, Roger, but it's a good idea. I'll steal it. <laughs> and he and I are good friends. He, he always gives me cre credit for ideas, but he was, Jay, we did this on stage and he joked, uh, he joked about that. Um, and so what I think is cool about the world of design and practices in design is they accidentally help you be Aristotelian, right? So, so that what I'd say is how you should choose among the possibilities is actually go try them and build up more compelling and less compelling arguments because some just won't, there's no way that you can make them compelling. They just weren't an idea that was inherently compelling enough, others will show that they're compelling by having the users get ever more exciting, excited as you make them better, better and better. So I don't know a way, uh, and I, I do not know a way upfront intellectually to make that decision of which of these new ideas to, to do. I would want to try with little experiments 
uh, to see if we can move something in a direction of the user loving it, or if we just we just can't, uh, in which case you know that it isn't as compelling. So there's a really interesting follow-up question to that, because you talk a lot about this false dichotomy between strategy and execution. And it sounds to me like the process you were just describing really shows that you can't make that decision up front. So there's not some kind of, oh, grand strategic plan, and then, oh, let's give it to the underlings to execute, right? That's not possible in the world of possibilities. That doesn't, doesn't work anymore the same way it might have worked in the past. Maybe it didn't even work then, but- It, it never worked then. Yeah. <laughs> so, so what's your take on that? Because I think that's a very interesting topic that what we see in companies today, they still make that distinction a lot. So can you tell us a little bit about your thinking behind those two topics, strategy and execution, which today are seen as separate, but probably aren't? Yes. Yeah, no, I, I feel like this is my, my Sisyphusian challenge. I'm pushing this rock uphill and not making much progress because it's so ingrained the notion that strategy and execution are, are two different things and are very important. Uh, really important to execute your, your, uh, your strategies. And um, I mean, for, for, for me, uh, I, I'm quite certain that the reason that this is so ingrained in people's mind is because we think by way of analogy in the world. Uh, there's a school of thought that says, unless we can analogize to something, we can't understand a thing, uh, which is why all VC pitches are, this is going to be the Warby Parker of, you know, diapers, or this is going to be the Uber of, of uh, snowboarding or whatever. People analogize uh, uh, to, uh, to something else. Actually, for the corporation is the human body. So... We, we think that the way the human body works is we have a brain that decides uh, and then a body that executes what the brain decides. Roger, lift your left hand. And, oh, there, my left hand uh, lifts because my brain told it, uh, told it to. And we've just applied that metaphor to the corporation. So the brain, of course, is top management. And what they do is they set strategy. And they say, Ta-da, this is our strategy. And then the uh, rank and file, everybody else in the organization is the, the arms and legs. And they just go do what the, the, uh, the brain says. And what we have highly developed now is systems for making them do what the, what the uh, brain says. Um, but it's just a completely fallacious uh, uh, for, uh, but we're, completely bought into it um and I, I it's one of these things I, I i take heart from peter drucker if he you know he bless him was so, was so nice to me before he before he passed uh, away and and uh you know one of the things i learned from him is because he does it did this repeatedly you sometimes have to say something uh now that people think is nuts now and 25 years later they uh, think it's common uh common wisdom so I'm waiting 25 years on, on this one. If at the top of, a, of an organization, uh, let's say, you know, I work with a lot, David Taylor, the CEO says, uh, we're gonna win on the basis of, of billion dollar plus highly differentiated products where we're number one uh, uh, in, in the category backed by leading edge research and, uh, and advertising at the scale you can only do do it in a plus brand. Ta -da. And then he says to all his organization, you go execute that strategy. Well, does that mean uh, um, Alex Keith, who runs Beauty Care, is just sort of doing nothing other than just saying, yes, that's, that's, that's my strategy? No, she's got to say, okay, let's see, Olay. How do we make sure it's number one in the, in the skincare? Uh, category. Oh, what's our where to play? What's our how to win f uh, for that? Uh, how about head and shoulders? How about Pantene? Uh, you know, how about secret uh, uh, deodorant? She's got to make a whole bunch of really difficult, challenging uh, strategic decisions. Uh, and I, even if she makes a bunch of decisions at the beauty care level, uh, the person running hair care for Alex, uh, Keith, is, is going to have to make 
specific decisions for for, for the portfolio there. Well, uh, what does Pantene do? What does Head and Shoulders do? What does Aussie do? What does Herbal Essences uh, do? And then the head of uh, of Pantene is going to have to make a bunch of decisions. So why do we call all those things execution when, to me, they look like making making decisions under competition at all levels? And if instead we said, you've got a cascade and make a set of choices, David Taylor's got a set of choices to make, Alex Keith has got a set of choices to make, people reporting to Alex Keith have a set of choices, people reporting to them have a choices to make, then everybody would be saying, my is to make difficult choices, not to quote, execute what somebody else says as if they're making all the choices. Uh, but it's so ingrained that, that uh, you know, I do, you know, talks where, where people are aficionados of this. So say, so what you're talking about is, is having to do strategy execution, Roger. And like, no, no, it's not. Why do you call it, uh, call it that? Uh, so, but this is a, this is a 25 year uh, battle. Um, it, it, it feels like, at least to, to me, it feels like when I first went on boards, uh, I hate public company boards and ceased to go on them. But uh, in my foolish youth, I, I, I went on my first big, you know, NYSC public company boards in 1999 uh, uh, and 2000. Yeah. And as soon as I got on the, uh, on the board and we were talking about giving guidance, I said, well, this is stupid, right? Like, why the hell are we doing this? This is nuts. Uh, there's no good that comes from uh, giving uh, earnings earnings uh, guidance. And I was told, well, you're not so, yeah, I was patted on the head, oh, you, you know, artisan, you know, academic-y person, uh, how silly you are, you have to do it. There is no choice, you have to do it. And I'm like, why? Well, just because, <laughs> right? Uh, and so, but what's happened now? Lots of the best companies have ceased getting Giving as it's recognized as stupid and useless. Uh, not all, the, you know, there are laggards who who are, are still engaging in stupid, useless things. But but the tide has turned. This one feels the same way. It's going to take that long, uh, to ten or fifteen years until people start to uh, say, uh, even though uh, we love this idea of let's execute the the strategy, uh, it's actually unhelpful, and we'll do we'll start thinking differently. I don't know. What do you think, Alex? <laughs> um, hi, Roger. It's actually Tendai here. Sorry. Oh, oh, Tendai. I, actually have, I have an interesting question for you, too, because, I mean, beyond the strategy and execution notion, it's also there's an implicit notion in there that things flow downwards. They cascade downwards always. Do you have any experience or any kind of thing, any way you can teach us about how the strategic choices that are being made further down in the organization, if you want to call it that, can also cascade upwards to reinform the strategy that's been developed um, at the top. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I, I, that's what I teach uh, Tendai. So, uh, you know, my, my framework is the, the strategy cascade, these five choices, right? Uh, winning aspiration, where to play, how to win, uh, capabilities, management systems. But the way I draw it is it's a whole stack of those from the top of the organization all the way to the to the bottom of the organization, and I have arrows running both directions. Because people ask me, well, Roger, in companies like this, do you do the top level strategy first and then the the bottom ones, or do you do the bottom ones first and then uh, then uh, go to the top? And I say, sorry, uh, the answer is both. Uh, you've got to toggle back and forth, uh, right? And so so if you uh, if you start at the top. You, the people at the top should say, based on what the strategies are below us, here's the strategy we'd, we'd set, here's why. Uh, now I want you to set the strategy at your level. So David Taylor saying to Alex Keith, I'd like to, to set the strategy at your level that is consistent with mine and reinforcing of mine. But the super important thing that the David Taylor in this picture has to, has to, has to say is, but Alex, if if as you're developing your beauty strategy, you say the choices I've made, I, David Taylor, have made at the Proctor corporate level 
uh, don't enable you to make the kind of choices that you really think you need to make to have beauty do spectacularly. Come back and tell me because I got to modify my, my choices. So it's this toggle back and forth between the levels. And Alex should be doing the same with, with, with her people saying, saying, but accomplish in, in beauty care. Here's my word of play, how to win for beauty care overall. Uh, now you in hair care, you got to You've got to, uh, uh, you figure out what's a great hair care strategy. But if my beauty strategy is creating constraints on you that, uh, make it impossible for you to, uh, winning strategy, tell me because that's a flaw in my strategy. It's that toggling back and forth that is, that is so, is so critical. And you can well imagine, Tendai, how much that changes the strategy dialogue from a, I'm the boss and you're just some, some subordinate taking orders to I got a job, which is figuring out how to knit together all of beauty care so that it fits within, within uh, what uh, David Taylor is doing across laundry, beauty care, home care, et cetera. Uh, uh, but you have a job, <laughs> an equally tough job, which is figuring out how to win against Unilever and J&J, &J, et cetera, in, uh, uh, in, sh in uh, shampoos and, and conditioners, hair care. Uh, we both have tough jobs that requ require decision making. And to make it sensible for shampoos to be part of hair care and part of beauty care, we've got Got to have synergies across these things, so it's a tricky business of making all those choices fit. Now we're partners in making choices, not a subordinate, a dominant, a, a kind of subordinate uh, relationship. That just makes everybody more productive, happier, better, uh, etc. So that's fascinating. And my question to you is almost like the the organizational structures that we have today. You know, in in most companies are very similar and they're still pretty hierarchical so even when they go towards flatter it's still pretty you know top down in the flatter sense they're cutting out a little bit of middle management so i'm almost wondering you know when when i listen to you do we need a substantial change in the way we have organizational structures and the way people work together to be able to get a lot better at strategy and these difficult you know decisions at every level so do we need to find a different organizational structure to decentralize this because we have to admit that difficult um and strategic choices are made at every level or if we want to call it every corner of the organization sure is it, can we can we even do what you're saying with the organization organizational structures that we have today still in most companies yeah. I think so. For me, for me on this front, I mean, I have other thoughts on, 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 uh, on the structure of, of jobs, but in terms of this question of hierarchy, I'm not, I'm not fussed at all by the fact that companies have hierarchy. I think we do need David Taylor asking Proctor level questions and Alex Keith asking uh, uh, beauty care que uh, questions. The head of champ, uh, hair care asking asking hair care questions, etc. And they do have to nest. So I'm I'm not that. What I think is we just have to change the nature of the dialogue. It's what people do in the structure uh, is is more is more important. And here's where the enemy, right? Literally, the great Satan in this whole structure is strategy versus execution. Because if you have that mindset, here's my strategy. You go execute it you are taking the hierarchy and you know perverting it for evil uh and and making it uh, making it it's it's what one completely false right uh and so people are put in the uh, put in the uh, in the following kind of bind right it, you know in the in the mob of of, uh, of business right? um if we have a, a ceo at the top setting strategy and then telling the so strategy is making choices and execution is something else so execution must be choiceless doing right otherwise we call it the same thing so so execution is choiceless doing of course the people below know they have to make choices they have one of they can take one of two paths they can say i will be mindless 
can engage in choiceless doing, in which case it'll be a total, total disaster and will fail, fail miserably. The problem is, then, if, it, if the, quote, strategy doesn't work, who will, what will be blamed? Bad execution. So it'll be their fault. If instead they say, yeah, this is all stu- you know, stupid terminology and I, and I have to make, I'm Alex Keith, and I have to make a whole bunch of really difficult strategic uh, choices and I'll, and, I'll, and I'll just suck it up and do that even though I'm being told it's execution, which is not actually the case. I shouldn't use Proctor because that's not what David Taylor does. Um, uh, and she makes brilliant strategy, cho- uh, strategy choices at the beauty care level. What is going to be the explanation for the success of, of Procter & Gamble in that case? Brilliant strategy. So everybody in the organization, other than the per- people at the top, is screwed. Either they will listen to the CEO and be blamed for bad execution, or they will ignore the CEO, and the CEO will get credit for a great, uh, great strategy. So there's, you've got this, you know, you know the, the, the amazingly low levels of engagement in, in, uh, in corporate uh, America and people, you know, lots of people actively undermining uh, their company. It's because it, the root cause of this has a whole lot to do with strategy for uh, execution. And the root cause of of lack of innovation is uh, is uh, um, you know kind of misinterpretation of uh, or ignoring half of what uh, Aristotle said. There's these very deep foundational uh, model problems where people have just bad, bad, bad uh, uh, models. So it is nature of dialogue more problematic uh, than uh, 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 than uh, the structure itself would be my. So, so our joint kind of battle of getting this across this message is going to go on for quite a bit, right? Um, yeah. I'll let Kavi um, take over uh, quickly to ask maybe a couple of the audience questions. So, oh, um, sure. sure. We sure. have a couple of people who came up with good questions, I think. Kavi? Yeah, um, just kind of latching on to the nature of the dialogue element of the conversation that just took place. One of the ones that stood out to me from the audience was this kind of question that, is it time to abandon words like strategy, tactics, or execution? And if we did abandon them, what would replace them? Uh, just making choices under uh, competition and uncertainty. That's what everybody, everybody's doing. Everybody in the organization lives in an uncertain environment where, where the future may be similar to the past and may be different than the past. There's uncertainty. And if it's different than the past, it'll be different in, in what way? So, Everybody is, is, is having to make choices to do some things and not other things and doing what you're doing now, uh, just continuing people, it's not a choice. No, it is. It's always, uh, always a, a, a choice. And you've got, uh, you've got competition, right? Uh, and, and, uh, and so I would say it, <clears throat> if we, I, I wouldn't mind, like, you know, strategies become such a perverted, you know, kind of use to judge. The word, even though I'm a strategist at, uh, uh, at, at, at heart, I wouldn't mind getting rid of that. But getting rid of this whole notion, oh, that's a, that's a strategy and that's a tactic, all of that is semantic, uh, semantically useless uh, uh, to, uh, to engage in. So I just think, he says in, uh, throughout the organization, my job is making choices. Uh, and I have to have to deal with the uh, with uncertainty, and I have to uh, uh, deal with competition. And I have users out there <clears throat> who I need to satisfy. Drucker, as in all things, is right for companies to to acquire and keep a customer. So so if you're just making choices about acquiring and keeping customers under uncertainty and competition, that's your job. And I couldn't care less if somebody calls it strategy or not. So quick follow up here. Um, somebody on on Twitter was asking, should senior leaders then, you know, in this context of making choices under uncertainty, should they trust their intuition more, not just the data like we were talking about before? Well, absolutely. In fact, they do, right? I mean, they. I mean, there's a whole because because everybody now who's you know who's in senior leadership has come out of. Uh, of a you know a business program or an engineering program or whatever has been has been taught that it, they are a, they are some kind of a corporate floozy if they don't uh, if they don't manage by the numbers 
make their decisions data based, right? They're taught that. They're taught that you're they're, they're, you're for some about if you don't make it uh, be, be in the numbers, but but these people are not fools. Uh, it's hard to be a fool and get to the top of a of a big uh, uh, corporation, and and so they they recognize in their hearts of hearts that actually the numbers don't tell you everything. In fact, the person who typically get that job is the person who does a bunch of things beyond the numbers, right? Like I work with enough boards on well, who's going to be the next CEO, and it's the person who can who has good relationships with the other people who people will look up to and want to work or work for. Is that all, all based on the numbers? No, it's, no, it's not. So the tricky thing though is, is often, and, and this is a gigantic business for the, the uh, big consulting firms. Often they need to have numbers generated to support their intuition. Right. And so they pay the public, or to come up with the data that backfills in in their uh, intuition. So I, I would say, I would say they've got to uh, develop that skill. A, a, a really good friend of mine who who I work with a lot, brilliant woman named Hillary Austin, who uh, did her PhD. Uh, no great now late great because he just passed away uh, recently. Jim March, one of the ten top management thinkers of the twentieth century. And Elliot Eisner, who's one of the greatest thinkers in the world of, of education, he's a Stanford education professor. March was a Stanford uh, business professor. She did her PhD under uh, under both of them, and she, out of their their work, she makes this distinction, saying um, there are two absolutely fundamental skills that you have to have to be an effective human being in the modern world. One, you've got to be good at manipulating quantities. That's essentially data analytics. We, you know, addition, subtraction, division, calculus, fluid dynamics are all are all methodologies for manipulating quantities to come up with good good things that we that we need to need to know. Um, but there's also a second thing you've got to be good at, which is appreciating qualities. Um, so, uh, if you only could manipulate quantities, you would go to a, 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 sh a show on abstract uh, impressionism at uh, at the uh, at the MoMA, uh, the Museum of Modern Art, and say, "Wow, that's cool! I saw I saw uh, kind of uh, uh, 850 square meters of paintings today. Wasn't that great?" Um, but if you appreciated qualities, you'd say, ah, a show on abstract uh, expressionism uh, that actually uh, set it out in a different way than I've seen before. They didn't categorize it, uh, the paintings in a similar way. They flowed it in time in a, in a different way. And that gave me a greater appreciation of what the movement was all about, right? That all appreciating qualitative aspects of what you're, of what you're looking at. Um, and what what I I would argue, uh, based on that on that insight, is is we're like we're like the you know the the uh, uh, <laughs> player who's got one gigantic right arm uh, uh, because uh, they spend all their time working on that and a left arm that they can barely lift over their shoulders. We in the business world train up to an incredible extent, uh, the manipulation of one and people are completely hopeless on and have no training whatsoever on the appreciation of, of uh, qualities. And what we need is a balance of the two so that, that executives realize that appreciation of qualities, which is what, what to having an intuitive feel for something. We call it intuition when you're making a qualitative assessment where you don't have pure data, you don't have stuff that's reducible to numbers, but you know anyway that this is this is what it feels like. So Steve Jobs couldn't did have no quantitative numbers to be able to tell them that that you know, agonizing over the curve, uh, curves around the edges of his of his uh, computers, uh, iPads, i uh, iPhones, etc. There's no quantitative measure that says 
you should obsess and spend all sorts of money on making sure that that curve is absolutely perfect. But he had an appreciation of qualities that enabled him to say what actually does look better or worse and what will the likely reaction of, of, uh, uh, of people uh, be to that. Uh, uh, but we, and, and I just think we're on the one, not on the other. And when people uh, often, you know, I get asked because I work with, you know, CEOs and things and they'll say, well, what, what, what should I do to help this person who we might want to have the CEO uh, uh, develop? Uh, and my answer often is uh, get them to do a sommelier course and say, uh, outside of work, what you've got to do is in the next two years, become a sommelier, become a cordon bleu chef, uh, take an art, art appreciation uh, course. And they're like, what? What are you talking about? I was talking about, you know, how they can be better with people or whatever, and, and you want them to become a sommelier? And I say, yeah, uh, because what the sommelier does is, is have to gain a, a sophisticated appreciation of qualities and the process of learning the appreciation of qualities is, is advisable, uh, but they will beat the crap out of them, this, this guy or this gal, uh, in, the, in the sommelier classes uh, until they realize that they can't quantify you know, everything and they have to, have to develop a system in their own head for appreciating uh, uh, qualities. Uh, and that's, that's, that's my... You know, kind of my thrust with these with these uh, with these folks is they're never going to be a great CEO if they are only good at manipulating quantities and and not appreciating uh, qualities. That's amazing, and it, it sounds to me almost like we need to have a change, uh, maybe in generation or just a, definitely in the style of or the type of leaders we have today. Because I would say, not that many that I've met. Not to say they're not smart, right? But they just don't exhibit right. those kind of uh, um, behaviors. So it it seems to me almost an and there's zero of it, Alex, in business <laughs> schools, zero. So like so, like, so, like you think about you think about your business school uh, education. What percentage of it could you say was about appreciation appreciation of qualities, and what? A percentage of what was about manipulation of quantities. Oh yeah, zero point zero zero. Yeah, yeah. It, liter it literally, it literally is. Even though some purport to be about appreciation of qualities, you might take a leadership course, right? But they don't teach you a systematic way of reflecting on your on your quality assessment, right? And this is why, of course, you know. If you just think about art school versus versus business school, what is the the testing uh, uh, approach in a business school? Right, you you, you right, you know take some time to get a case and you write some answer answer. What what happens in in art school at the end of at the end of the of the the course? What uh, what's the the evaluation mechanism? It's a crit, right? All your classmates and your teacher. You put your painting, if it's a painting course, up at the front, and and you have a crit right, where they where they say, well, why'd you do this? What about that? Could have you done this instead? Whatever. That is entirely non-quantitative. They don't say uh, up down how many people like this painting because that's useless, right? Because that won't give you any advice. It's this critical feedback from a peer group of people who can appreciate uh, uh, qualities. Um, and you develop your ability to both paint better, if it's a painting, painting course, uh, to paint better because you're getting feedback. But you also, because all of you give feedback, you get better at being able to give feedback. And both of those things end up enhancing your appreciation of, of uh, qualities. So crucial. I, I think that's a wonderful way to end it. This, this ability that we need to develop in senior leaders and across the organization to have better conversations, design critique, right? Yes. Design critique about strategy. I, I love that image. And I think it's a, a great way to end this uh, wonderful chat. And I'll hand it over to Kavi. And our, I already thank you uh, from my side, Ed, 
every conversation with you is a great learning experience. So I, I thank you for that. Oh, well, likewise, Alex. You're one of the best. Awesome. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you to Roger for taking the time to have that wonderful conversation with us. Thank you, Alex, once again for hosting and Tendai for joining us. Welcome to the team, Tendai, and to Hank, who's been diligently drawing, uh, or, sorry, have you, sorry, I say taking visual notes throughout this session. To all of you still listening, um, I will be following up in the next 24 hours with a, re with a recording of this session. Um, I'll also point you to some key links based on the questions that you've been asking that um, not only surround the Invincible Company book that Alex and the team has been working on, but also some of the questions that you have around uh, Roger's work as well. You can expect that directly in your inbox. Until then, thank you so much for joining us for another Strat Chat session. Once again, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, we love that we could have you here from all over the place. Have a good day or week. Good night, everybody.